Hello, well, welcome back. It's Mark Fielding Richard again here from ME Fieldings, and today we are looking at the final part, part three of leases. Um, as you should all well know by now, if you've been watching these videos, I am partner here at the firm of ME Fieldings. Um, we have done parts one and two of leases, so part number three just finishes up some outstanding items. We haven't looked so far at the accounting for lessors, for finance leases, and then we need to go on and look at the disclosure requirements. Right, please notice that to watch this video, you will have to have watched part two because it, the examples do actually follow on. So welcome back anyway. Um, as usual, I would say that this is relevant for ACCA, ICAW students, and I guess anyone else in practice who is looking at leases. Um, I think everything that we say today will be relevant for both IFRS and for IPSAs. But as always, our focus is on IPSAs. So we'll be, we'll be um, mainly concentrating on that. Um, you can see, therefore, the name of the website, or you can contact us through the uh, comments below. So, hope you enjoy the videos, and remember, like us on Facebook and all that stuff. You know, if you've got friends who you think might be interested, please recommend them to watch the videos as well. Right, let's move straight into, therefore, slide number two. And slide number two looks at accounting um, as for the example that we used in part number two. So make sure that if you're coming on to this, you go back and watch video number two, because this is the second part of that example from part two. Okay, okay. So once again, I just, just really can't stress this enough. Following on from an example that we gave you in part two, so make sure you see that. What happened, just to recap anyway, is that we had an asset. Um, the minimum value of the future lease payments was going to be 100 and the list price of the asset was 110. Uh, the sums payable were payable, oh, as I remember in advance, and the um, rate of interest inherent in the lease was something like 10%. So what we looked at, therefore, um, was how do, what are the debits and credits for accounting for this asset in the books of the lessee? Now what's happening in this slide is that we're looking at the lessor so you can see there from this, uh, just recapping on the question, we looked at the lessor. It doesn't actually tell you in the example exactly how much they paid for the asset, but it gives you the list price. So assuming that you're a student, assuming that you're a student, you will assume, you will assume that that's the price that they paid for it. That's the price that the lessor paid for the asset. Just think about how the deal works. The lessor purchases the asset, and then the lessor leases it, to the lessee. The lessee pays their monthly or their annual or whatever payments that these things are, and they must cover the capital cost plus any interest and so on. So that's our scenario. Right, we're now in the books and records of the lessor. So this is the leasing company. Now, from our example, we're assuming that the leasing company has purchased this asset for 110, so therefore we've got debit purchases Right, please notice that these assets aren't going to be treated as fixed assets in the books and records of the lessor. They're kind of like stock in trade, yeah? So we've got debit purchases, assuming we pay cash, credit cash of 110. Right, now look what happens. Transfer to the lessee, we debit receivables 100 and credit revenue 100. That is because at that point, what's happening is we are making a sale of the asset. It's a fixed asset, remember? This is a finance lease. And the sum, the 100, is the minimum value of the lease payment. So that's your minimum value of your lease payment. So can you notice, therefore, that in fact what's happening is that the revenue is only going to be 100. So we've actually got immediately a loss. So we get that the purchase is 110, then the sales proceeds was 100. So the gross loss is recorded. Now that's before finance income. Remembering that they'll have in their revenue finance income as well. Go back into part two and have a look at the calculations. But you can see, therefore, that uh, as I remember, that's the first year, 2021. And in the first year, therefore, they've got finance income coming through of seven. So, in fact, your loss in the first year is only three. So, 2021, we debit cash 28, 
Look at your example. 28 is the annual payment that they're going to make over having four years, I guess. So we credit the receivables 21 and we credit the finance revenue 7. Hmm. I hope that's okay. Right, please make sure you go back and look and see where those numbers come from and how those numbers are calculated. And that's in presentation number two. But the way that YouTube works, it should be connected to this. Right, any other income that you earn from this will also go through your revenue. So remember that these are the minimum lease payments, but it's quite likely that the lessee will be paying more than the, than the minimum lease payments. So those payments go through as well. So therefore, in the books and, books and records of your lessor, you've got this revenue in year one, which is transfer of the asset at the value of the minimum lease payments. That's treated as the capital value of the asset. You've got your finance payments on top, and then there could well be a third line in your revenue, and that will be additional payments over and above the minimum lease payments. So look for those as well. Right, that's how we account for it in the books and records of the lessor, and that gives you your debits and your credits. So you've now got your receivable, which has been reduced by 21. You've got your finance revenue. You've got your cash and so on. Again, you know the deal now. If anyone has any problems with that, please come back to me and ask again. But I do stress that once again, I'm going to just keep saying this, that you watch the, uh, video number two, because it will show you where those numbers actually come from. And you can see the link between the two. How what goes through the books and records of the lessee will mirror what goes through the books and records of the lessor. Okay, let's move on and have a look at slide number three then. So slide number two looked at the situation where we had a finance lease. Slide number three then goes on and looks at the situation where we have an operating lease. Now it says here, therefore, the asset is included in PP&E on acquisition. That is in the books and records of the lessor. So now you've got the leasing company. The leasing company is taking the asset and it's putting that asset into its property, plant and equipment. Remember the difference between a finance lease and an operating lease. And the easiest example is motor cars. Now what's happening is that you, the lessee, is going on holiday and you are renting a car for a week. That is a standard operating lease. There is no intention that you're going to buy that car. The lessor, therefore, is the car rental company which is leasing its car out for a week. And in that organization's books and records, the, the asset, the motor car, will be shown there. And it will obviously be depreciated over the life of the asset as well. So the lessor takes the, the asset, in our example, the motor car, into its books and records. It capitalizes it on purchase. It will have a useful life and it will depreciate it over that useful life. In addition to that, the lessor will have income. That's the rental income that you pay when you go and rent their car. And assuming you pay cash, they will debit cash and credit rent, rent um, twice. They will debit cash and credit revenue as and when that money is earned. As for the lessee, the lessee will simply have an expense in their income statement, and that and that expense will be equal to the amount of the rental cost. We calculate them on an accruals basis. So if you're renting it for three months and you pay it all up in advance, you'll, you'll accrue it over three months you'll spread the cost over three months. But for lease accounting, much more, much more simple. As opposed, to, as opposed to finance leases, where with the finance lease, the leasing company treats the transfer of the asset as a sale at that point, and then it takes the finance income into its revenue as well. The lessee puts the asset into its balance sheet as its own asset and depreciates it over time, and then it will have an income, um, it will have a finance cost which it pays up every year. And you will have your receivables and your payables, which so your receivable, your leasing receivable will be in the book of the the books of the lessor. And you'll have your payable, which is in the books of the lessee, for finance leases. Operating leases, much, much more straightforward, much more simple. Okay, so we're moving on to look at the disclosure requirements now that are required in sets of accounts. Um, 
We've talked about leases as well before in parts one and two, and you are going to find that leases are much more complicated and much more intricate at a government level. So for those of you who are doing hipsters, that then they are at a usual uh, operating company level. Well, most most companies who are who are lessors in um, an operating lease environment, so car rental companies, they buy the cars, depreciate them over however many years they keep them for, and then they have the income from the people who rent them. Because of this idea that it's so much harder to split out what is a finance lease and what is an operating lease for government organisations, because of the idea that they'll rent out buildings to other government ministries, the peppercorn rents or whatever, these things do start to kick in and be much more important. So you do need to be aware of these disclosure requirements. Having said that, they come virtually straight from the IFRS, and you'll see that there's a lot of consistency between them, so you can learn them very, very quickly. So all I can really do at the moment is give you a list of what they are, but you are going to have to watch these. Again, if you have any problems with them, come to us, um, and we can maybe help you with these, if you're particularly working on an Ipsos project. So we're going to start with operating leases for the lessor. They have a government department which is leasing out assets, but it's leasing them out on an operating basis. Now again, the hard part will be coming to the decision that this is an operating lease. But once you've got there, just have a look at the kind of things that they're looking for here. So the future minimum lease payments and the non-cancellable operating leases. So again, if you're looking at an operating lease which is non-cancellable, but is running for up to five years, you're going to be looking for certain specific kinds of transactions. But notice as well, therefore, that the, the lessor, therefore, is going to be receiving funds from an operating lease. And from the operating lease, um, we're going to be receiving funds and revenue for a period of up to five years. So we have to show those things split into the three different categories, and we have to show them in aggregate. Um, once you've done your basic splitting, and, and that's going through your decision charts, deciding what is an operating lease and what is a finance lease, the actual disclosure should be relatively straightforward. So that's your first thing, is showing what your minimum lease payments are. Having said that, having worked out what minimum lease payments are is not that easy as well. But usually by this stage, you're just gathering information that, that's already been calculated. So you show your minimum lease payments for the three different sections, for the three different periods of time, and then you just add them all together and show a total. Right, any total contingent rents recognized in the statement of financial performance in the in the period. So good to see we've got the right terminology now, statement of financial performance. So these are contingent rents. So these are rents which are going to become due. Um, again, you know, if you're looking at, if you've got operating leases and you're looking at things like photocopiers, this will be things where we know that the number of copies we are going to do is going to be additional payments over and above. So the lessee is telling you that we are going to have these extra payments to you. And we've included these extra payments because the cash is, is going to be on its way or has already or has already been received. So that's what these things are here. It's this extra sums over and above minimum lease payments that have been received or are due to be received. And finally, a general description of the lessor's um, leasing arrangements for the organization. That should be fairly, fairly straightforward. What is this company? Why is it operating? Why is it um, sending out operating leases and so on and so forth? So what's the environment that it's operating in? Um, and, and I would hope that, that that wouldn't give you too many problems to do that. You can write a couple of pages and there's no shortage of examples you can take. Right, those are, the, those are go away and read the standard if you're doing this. You have to read the standard because you have to know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, and some organizations may want to put more and more and more through their balance sheets and more and more and more disclosure because they think it makes their organization look good. And others may want to do less and less. So, so make sure wh where it is that, that you know who you are and what it is that you're actually disclosing. But it shouldn't really be too difficult to understand from, from reading the standard itself. So now you'll see that we've moved on from the lessor to the lessee. And we're still looking at operating leases, so bearing in mind, you have to remember what an operating lease is. Um, once again, I'm just going to repeat the same old point again, that you will find that because it's a government organization, there are a lot more intricate and there's a lot more to do here than there is in normal general commercial organizations. A commercial organization may rent a car here and there, you have fleet cars or whatever, or they may have some operating lease over certain small amounts of offices. 
but we may find that these things fall at, for government organizations you may find certain long-term transactions fall as operating leases because of the fact that the rents are at peppercorns and so on so you are going to have to have your thinking hat on when you're looking at these um I certainly don't want to undermine people who work in the in the private sector but they are likely to be much more complicated so here you go, this is taken straight from the standard, so you can read all of this stuff straight out of the Ipsos itself. It's Ipsos number 13, yeah? So less these, so now we've got the people who are actually doing the renting. So the future minimum lease payments under non cancelable operating leases for each of the following period. Um, I think you have to do it in total as well. So you'll see that it mirrors, it mirrors the information that, you're, that the lessor is, is disclosing as well. So if you just have the, just the two company thing, all the transactions between each other, the two things should be exactly the same. So future minimum lease payments under non cancelable leases. You see that my American spell checks picked up the American way of spelling cancelable. Uh, not later than one year, one to five years and more than five years. Um, and that should be relatively straightforward. Because you'll prepare in real life, you'll prepare a spreadsheet of leases and then you prepare all the information that you need. So once you've got your big Excel spreadsheet, Excel will do it all for you. Uh, the total value, I have decided to read this twice, but the, um, the total value of minimum sublease payments to be received. Right, so notice here that what they're doing is they're matching the sublease payments received. So you have an operating lease, but then the asset you are subletting or subleasing that asset or part of that asset out to someone else. And the point here, I think, is that what you're getting in Part B offsets what you have to pay in part A and that's why it's included there. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, I, I don't think that there's anything really difficult or technical to understand in terms of what we're looking for. Where your problems in terms of Ipsos will come is actually calculating the numbers. Uh, what is an operating lease? What is a finance lease? What are the minimum lease payments? Um, certainly in organisations I've worked in where we've gone from cash-based accounting to accrual based accounting we've had to sit down with the lawyers and say right we must be able to derive this information from a lease so when you write them into in your legal language the documents you're going to sign you must have these clauses in them because we need this and in fact what we've done for some of them we've added it as an addendum and so therefore we have appendix number whatever seven or eight and it shows this is what the, the standard requires and then you'll see that the numbers are actually given to you in the signed lease itself and we've done that for a few uh, in a few countries, and we have usually no problem, no problem with lessors. They're usually happy to sign these documents once they understand why it's there and what it's there for. Okay, you'll notice that that's operating lease disclosure one. There is an operating lease disclosure two as well. Once again, you would expect that the disclosure for the person who is paying will be greater than from the person who is receiving. So as I said in the last slide, um, now we're looking at the lessor. This is still an operating lease, remember, this is obviously slide number two. And you'll see that it just goes into a bit more a bit more detail. So in part C we've got lease payments recommend um, recognised as expenses in the period. So what's in your in your financial performance statement, what's in your income statement, minimum lease payments, um, contingent rents, which is just the payments over and above your lease payments, and then any sub lease payments that you've got as well. Um, and we've got here notice from the standard that says sublease payments, not sublease amounts um, included as income. I think that's fairly straightforward as well. Um, I'm not honestly sure of why there should be a difference between lease payments and sublease payments, but it seems to want you to keep them to keep them separate. I suspect that that's just a, a not such a great wording of the standard, and in fact it means subleases, sums of cash received for subleases that should be in there. I've just, just <coughs> excuse me, I've just cut and pasted this from the standard. So D, a general description of the lessee's significant leasing arrangements. Right, but notice that now that they don't leave it quite as open as they do for the as they do for for the for the lessor. So here we've got the significant leasing arrangements, and it must include the basis on which contingent rate payments are determined. Right, so this means that when you've got additional payments over and above, you have to say or how those things have been calculated. Right, please do bear in mind materiality. If you've got the Ministry of Education and you've gone over a, on a couple of photocopies, then you don't really bother too much because it won't be material. So it's only actual material items. Um, 
what they, they particularly want to see here is to make sure that the things have been correctly calculated as well. So you're not over or understating these contingent extra payments. Um, point number two relates to, certainly for renewal or purchase option, um, we've got an operating lease here, but is there anything in there that says that we can buy this thing? Or is there anything in there that says that we have to renew it? Um, certainly you see some odd ones of these coming up now. One I've seen not so long ago is a football team and they were leasing a player and the player was owned by a South American individual. And if the player played a certain number of games, his contract was automatically renewed and therefore he was automatically signed on for another year. So those are the kinds of things. That's nothing to do with governments, I don't think, in most countries. But that's something that you need to look at. If you use the asset for a certain amount of time, do you then have to renew the contract? And again, what we're really getting concerned about here is, is this thing going to become, at some stage, a finance lease or not? So those are your renewal and purchase options. Escalation clauses are when the fees begin to rise. And so you may find, therefore, if you have any, um, and I guess this goes hand in hand with point one, do you have fees that rise over time, or do you have fees that rise with usage, and so on? What happens with these fees, and how does that tie into point number one? Um, if we're paying percentages of profits and so on. Um, so how do those two things go hand in hand together? Finally, uh, restrictions imposed by lease arrangements such as those concerning returns of net surplus, returns of capital contributions, dividends, additional debt and further leasing. Um, you will see these once again where we are doing things like we are leasing um, oil drilling or coal, oil drilling equipment, coal equipment. What will be happening is that the, the government has decided that it's discovered coal in a certain area. It needs to raise funds for that, so it will lease the assets. Um, so it leases the assets. Now what happens with those assets? So then return as a net surplus. The, the leasing company which has provided these things may also, in addition to the minimum lease payments, get some percentage of profit. So what happens with that profit? Return of capital contributions. If the profit goes over a certain level, do we start to get some of the capital contributions back? Uh, sometimes the banks will take some of the security and then we'll pay the security back. If it's set up through some legal profit-making organization, what happens to the dividends? Is there a restriction on the dividends? They can only be paid specifically after all lease payments have been met. Um, again, if it's capital intensive, can we raise additional funds? And also, is it possible to split the asset? You may find that you'll get into issues here because the leasing company will provide all of the assets to get the coal out of the ground. But what about the assets for storage? What about the assets for distribution? And also things like weighing as well. You have to have weigh stations and so on. To pay tax, various levels of taxes if it's a PPI and so on. So we need to know what all of these restrictions are, what's happening with them, and also really how we've dealt with them. So how has the, how has the individual government organization, which is the lessee, dealt with these? Um, and they will become very, very complicated if they're major, major systems. Right, once again, you therefore, you know, as far as this being an exam question, it's really not so difficult. You can write that stuff quite neatly in an exam. In real life, deciding what is important, what is not important, how it goes, much more complicated. We're here to help you if you need us. Okay. Okay, I think there was a little mistake at the end of slide six there. I think, sorry, at the very start of slide six, I think I started talking about less swords. Slide six, of course, relates to less thieves. Anyway, the last three slides that we looked at all looked at operating leases. So now here on slide number seven, we're moving on to look at finance leases. So once again, continuing with our disclosure requirements, we're going to start with the lessor. So now we've got a government organization which is purchasing presumably fairly major capital items and then is uh, transferring them on to other government organizations. And it's doing that through the mean, means of a finance lease. So we've got disclosure requirements for, for the lessor. So notice what it wants here. It wants a reconciliation between the total gross investment in the lease at the reporting date and the present value and the present value of minimum lease payments receivable at the reporting date. So therefore, if we're looking at this at the very start of the lease, those two things should be broadly the same, unless there's anything else that they've included in there, such as admin fees or anything like that. Um, so we get this idea that hopefully the total gross investment at the start of the project and the minimum lease payments would be the same. 
Then what it's saying, now read close to the very first point there, if it's at the reporting date. So if it's at the end of the year, if there's any difference between those two things, changing the minimum leaf payment and the total gross investment in the lease, if there's any difference between those things, you have to show what that difference is. And then the second point goes on to stretch it out further. So it's basically saying any differences between not later than one year, one year, five years, and later than five years. Now those things will change if you've got changes in in the lease itself. So therefore, if you've got things like escalation clauses, if you've got things like penalty clauses, if you've got things like additional services, or if the lease has been renegotiated, you'll start to get changes in those things. Um, the other thing as well is things like if, if whatever reason the lease is written in such a way that it's a variable interest rate, you've shown it at the start of your expected interest rate. So changes in interest rates will affect those things as well. Um, changes in currency as well, if your assets in the foreign currency can change as well. Because if you're reporting in dollars, but the, the asset and the lease is actually in Russian rubles, as the ruble moves, you'll get changes there as well. So we get this idea that we show, in principle, what is the, the present value of the minimum lease payments at the start, is what you've calculated your asset at, and then as minimum lease payments change for whatever reason over time, you'll get changes and you must reconcile those things. You know, what you really, really don't want to see is that the value of the receipt is falling and falling and falling, and, and that may be the case, and that may be the case that, that that's true. Um, while, while the value of the asset stays the same. So we've got this idea of the reconciliation. I hope that's quite clear. Please notice, therefore, you show at the current reporting date, and then you've got these three things in the future. You've got one year, one year to five years, and more, to five year, and more than five years. And again, if there are changes in the, lease, in the terms of the lease over time, then those things will change as well. Where you have those things, you also have to give a description of what they have. Right, if you have a specific situation or something that you're not clear on, then let us know. We'll be happy to help you with that. So in slide number eight, bearing in mind that we're looking at a government organization, assuming this is Ipsos acting as a leasing company, we saw that the, the main differences that we've got there, or the main, sorry, the main differences, the main disclosure requirements are this idea that we show what we're expecting to receive in future years, and we've got this idea of one year, one five and more than five years. Um, this is the lessor, so other items that you would disclose as well, um, unearned finance revenue. So this is a situation where people for whatever reason have paid you interest in advance. It's quite possible, I suppose, that if somebody particularly needs to lease an asset from you, you can make them pay money up front. You can see that happening in governments where they need the money up front to pay wages and salaries while they're waiting for more cash to come through. So if you do have unearned earn finance revenue, so you've received the money, so they've paid interest in advance, but it hasn't been earned yet, you would disclose that. So that kind of makes sense, but it would be unusual to see it being a, a very large um, a, a very large number. All right, second one down there, unguaranteed residual values occurring to the benefit of the lessor. All right, this is a situation where, if you take your car leasing company, remember these are finance leases, so this is a situation where your lessee enters into a lease to, to lease a car. The car has a, a resale value as long as it's not damaged or smashed up. Um, but those those values of that car are not guaranteed. The government organisation has to be able to sell the car for that value. Now it may be that they have a car auction company or a second hand car company that guarantees them those values. But that would be quite unusual that they would be guaranteed. So therefore where you have this idea where we have assumed a residual value of the asset, the asset will return to the leasing company and the leasing company will sell it. If those residual values are unguaranteed, then you need to disclose what they are. Notice again that this is going to be a large-scale organisation, so you're not disclosing individual motor cars, but you'll disclose groups of motor cars and groups of values together. Um, the third one down, accumulated allowance for uncollectible minimum, which is a very long way of saying these are bad debts. Yeah? So you've got someone who's leasing an asset and they're not paying for it. You have an allowance for bad debt, so you have to say what your bad debt allowance is. Uh, number four, contingent rents recognised in the statement. So what are these things? Again, you're just disclosing major items, material items. 
But again, you know, if we're looking at motor cars, this idea that people are doing more miles per year than their leasing um, um, agreement allows, and you lump them all together and say what they are. And finally, a general description of the organization's material leasing arrangements. So what are the kind of assets that they do? And this is assuming that it's a fairly specific um, leasing business. So what are these things? What is the thing that they do? How do they, how do they disclose all of these items? and so on and so forth. Um, again, there's a million and one um, examples of that in the internet, and if anyone has any problems, please contact us. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the lessor. Bearing in mind here now then that the lessor is going to be receiving money for an asset it owns, do you remember as well that these things are minimum? So if there's something that you feel is really important with your client, but it's not in the list, then you should disclose it as well, because you have to give all the information to users of accounts that they require. So slide number nine continues in what I would call a similar vein. We're now looking at lessees and we've got finance leases. So you see there's a couple of slides on this, but you're already by now should be getting an idea that, that what's required from these things is the same. So we will disclose for each class of assets, right? Each class of asset means that in the balance sheet you have your different classes of assets, PPE, you have motor cars, uh, computers, and so on and so forth. So the net carrying amount, so the net carrying amount is your net book value. Bearing in mind this is a finance list, so the lessee takes the asset into its balance sheet as if it owns it. So therefore it will have um, uh, obviously an acquisition value being equal to the minimum lease payments, and it will then have a useful life over which it's depreciated. So what is what we used to call in the olden days the good old net book value. Then it says, uh, part number B, there are reconciliation between the future minimum lease payments at the reporting date and, and their present value. Um, those things in principle, in principle, should be the same, but they may have changed if there has been some change in uh, discount rates, for example, or if there is some other change. Who knows? Maybe we've clicked in certain clauses in the contract, and if we've clicked in clauses in the clauses, so therefore we've now know that we have to make these additional um, minimum lease payments, then we should actually change the value of the asset. So therefore, you need to show what's happening, you know, what was the value at the start of the year, what's the value at the end of the year, and we do a reconciliation, all shown at present value as well. And then we get the same idea that you've already seen with the less or that we show the same information for one year, one to five years, and five years as well. So this idea of showing what's coming in the future. And again, something that you've seen before at point number D there, contingent rents recognised and expense in the period, so what are the payments that we've made or that we will have to make over and above the minimum lease payment? Right, I don't think that there's anything there. I don't want to go into that in a massive amount of depth because it starts to get a little bit boring for you. But again, you know where we are. If you have any specific questions on specific items, um, and, and it will, because it, just reading the standard itself here is, is, you know, there's not a lot of laughs in there, but it all looks very straightforward. Then we start to apply this information in real life it suddenly becomes so much harder. What is the contingent rent? And what if we don't know whether it's going to be paid by three years or five years? Um, and, and so on and so forth. And these are usually things that you end up having to make judgment calls on. And the client, we usually find we're helpful. Okay, if you have any questions with that, please send us questions. Slide number 10 is similar vein as well. So slide number 10, we're looking at disclosure requirements for lessees, and again, this just follows on, and there really should be anything new for you here. So let's just bash through them very, very quickly to get through this. Um, I would just reiterate that when you read them in the standard, they will look very easy, and as someone who currently doing this slide, this video is acting as a cheater, it all looks very nice and easy. When you come to do this stuff in real life, you're going to have to keep this close to you, and you're going to have to work out where you have to make decisions because actually doing the stuff in real life is much, much harder than it sounds listening to me. However, you've seen all this stuff before. It's the same as for operating leases. So number E, the total of future minimum sublease payments expected to be received. So what subleases did we get? Because that, as a disclosure item, reduces our risk. Yep. Um, so how much money are we going to receive in terms of subletting these items that we have under finance leases? F, the general description of material leasing arrangements. Once again, notice that they 
Notice that they drive you down certain routes now, though. The basis on which contingent rent payable is determined, so you actually just, just giving your policy there, same as before, how is this calculated? And it should you should be able to cut and paste it from, from the actual agreement itself. Existence in terms of renewal or purchase options, Right, this becomes much more much more important, I think, than for operating leases, because under finance leases, the purchase options will be written in there, and they're likely to be much more varied. Your standard textbook will say, okay, you pay one pound, and on the payment of that one pound or that one dollar, um, ownership transfers. It's often much more complicated than that. So you need to go through the leases and see what happens at the end of the lease. Bearing in mind that a leasing company, which is leasing assets, usually doesn't want them back. Um, we had a couple of clients when I was working in practice, when I was out in Russia, when leasing first started, they were leasing heavy plant and equipment, and then they came to work one day and found that the car park was full of diggers and whatever else, that the lessees had returned to them. So they do watch that, because usually the leasing company doesn't want the stuff back. Um, so for the, for the lessee, therefore, what happens to the lessee until they have to purchase it? Often you'll find that they virtually have to purchase it or that the, the, um, the lessor has a put option. So in other words, they can make them buy it. So look very carefully at that and that will be a much bigger, um, um, that will be a big area of, dis of disclosure. Finally, your escalation clauses, again, much more important for the lessee because you need to disclose what these things are because an increase in cost is obviously a much more a much bigger negative effect for the lessee than it is for the lessor. So on that basis you need to say what they are. And finally any restrictions imposed and again it will usually be these will be negatives for the lessee. So the lessee needs to say what effect these leasing arrangements have on their business. And we kind of talked about this already, like return of capital contributions, dividends. Um, particularly important with governments where the lessee is a PPI, so you've got a public partnership and the partners may include foreigners who may have a very nice idea of leasing cheap from the government and then getting the funds out of the country as fast as possible. So um, very important to look at that and work out what they are. Um, ideas of additional debt, what happens with additional debt as well. Right, again, looks nice and easy. I think it's quite clear what these things are. Where you will have problems with them is when you do it the other way around. In other words, you are working with the lessee to work out which of these things are relevant. And also pushing the lessee down the route of disclosing these things because they may not want to disclose all of these items. So we looked in the previous slides at the disclosure requirements. Um, it is, as I say, fairly dry. While well, you're just reading it, um, if you're actually doing it in real life, it will become much more important, much more important and much more exciting. It, it's actually just a huge area when you're doing it. This implementation is looking at leases for government, working out what is the lease, and of course we've now got the new standard on concession rights as well. So you have to put concession rights and leases next to each other. Um, particularly where we see things, you know, I worked at the UN for three years, um, where we've got items where you've got donated right to use and so on, further complicates it. And again, just being in an IPSA's implementation team where you're sitting in head office in the capital, but you're relying on people around the country to send you these things if they're not centrally entered in the computer system already becomes very, very difficult. And it becomes a huge management process. Hand in hand with that system then, we look at all the issues arising with leases. So just running through these, if we look at valuation here, therefore we see, so just moving on to slide now, this is slide number 11, and we're looking at what's going to happen with the auditors, where will the auditors be looking, and in terms of your relationship with the auditors, where, where would you be expecting some discussions to come? Um, valuation of leases, certainly this idea that lease liabilities are not recorded at an appropriate present value, you know, what you're really talking about with your guys here is, with your auditors, is getting your, getting your process audited. And when you've got your process audited and your process works, so they've agreed your decision charts that, yes, this is a finance lease, yes, this is an operating lease, yes, this is a concession, and so on. Once you've got that far, it should be okay. But particular areas, once that we've agreed on, on our decision charts, 
Um, and, and the decision charts tell you what to finance. You see, you, you go down, you know, we've got this document, is it an operating lease, is it a finance lease, is it a concession? Um, once you've got to that part, therefore, you'll see here then finance lease liabilities are recorded at future cost with no present value valuation. Um, that happens, particularly here, you're going to find what is an appropriate present value to you, so what's an appropriate discount factor, what are minimum lease payments, um, and, and so on and so forth. These, these again, are, are process agreements, but you do often find that people will will send you in details of the lease and they won't make any actual present value calculations because they don't understand what that actually means. Um, and again, your calculation of the present value will be different for a, a government organization and for a commercial organization. So making sure that the present value is the present value discount factor is calculated, is used, uh, and the explanation of where it comes from and why you've used it is agreed with the auditors as well. Um, secondly, that not all directly attributable costs, so you've got in, initial indirect costs, are added to the overall lease cost. So making sure, therefore, that while we've got this idea that it's the minimum future lease payments, that it includes all of the payments that will be made under the terms of the lease. So you've got organizational fees, administration fees, so on and so forth. So making sure that all of these things are included as well um, and, and are not just simply transferred out. And you, you need to look very carefully at what they are as well. So those are valuation issues. How do we actually value the thing? And that will be one of your, one of your biggest areas as well. Those will be technically difficult areas where you then have to have difficult discussions with the auditors and you're requiring the auditors to use some common sense and agree with you. If you get this idea that you've got the supreme audit body and they're simply going, give us a document that proves it, give us a document that proves it, you're going to have a lot of problems here because we're moving away from that to opinion-based accounting. Um, good luck. That's all I can say to you. Um, again, if anyone needs any help with that, do contact us. We'll be happy to come and talk to the auditors with you. And we have done that for certain governments. Um, right, completeness. Not all this is being reported. This usually occurs not because people just don't have the information. Um, you do get circumstances where you don't have leases, so we decided that we would, the Ministry of Transport decided that we would let the, the Ministry of Defence use a building, and that was back in 1930, and it's never been documented, and they pay for the Christmas party every year. Um, this is something where, you know, l using Ipsos implementation as a tidy up tool works, so you need to get your legal department to get get those those agreements written and then once they've been written then you have to disclose them. Um, leasehold improvements, particularly with buildings, are not reported where they belong to the lessor, for example. Uh, donated rights to use agreements are not reported because there's no money changing hands um, and so we need to include those as donations. Certainly for the person who is the owner of the asset, it's not usually a problem because it then shows that they're donating to others. But you need to put a value on that. So you need to develop a checklist and when you're developing your checklist then you need to show on the checklist these kind of items and make sure that people are thinking about these things. Again, you know, dealing with an accounting function that's away in some provincial town and that's in a municipal, they can go, they go yeah, 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 we, we've got 25 leases and we photocopied them and uploaded them to SharePoint, blah, 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 but what about, what about, what about? Um, and then you're starting to get, you know, difficult areas for them to work with. But your auditors, assuming that they're smart, are going to come up with these questions and you need to be ready for them. So moving on, following on from slide 11, slide number 12, our final slide here, uh, other audit issues that are going to arise with leases. Rights and obligations, not all assets pertaining are being properly recognized. And you see that lease payments not properly calculated. Um, th this could conceivably be an issue in real life. Um, it basically falls down to you, assuming that you're in or you're head of the IPSAS implementation team, you need to check some of these payments yourself. Where, where you will get issues, uh, particularly with leases, is where the leases are actually dealt with by the property management group as opposed to being dealt with by the finance department. And so the property management group don't really understand what the accounting requirements are, and often you'll find that when the accountancy training is run, the property management group aren't sent on it because they're in property management, why would you send them on accountancy training? Um, the, the, the point, therefore, is that they don't actually understand what it is that they're doing, and that 
you know, their management, property managers, specialists, they're not accountants, so it's certainly not their fault. If that's the situation, therefore, you need to make sure that they are sending you the correct information because you, you probably won't be actually be responsible for the numbers. The, the the responsibility for the numbers will rest with the individual ministries. So in that in that situation, you need to develop some sort of a template to give them some sort of an idea what they're doing with. Um, I've always found that Microsoft Access is very good for this kind of thing. You give you give Microsoft Access, and then you can design a template. You can design your decision sheet and run some training for your property management people, and they will get the stuff for you. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you will also come across this, this certain types of people who don't want to learn, and there'll be motivation issues, um, and particularly when you get on to this idea that they're not just going getting a lease, scanning it and sending it up to a SharePoint dump, where they actually have to go through it, decent calculations, and this is in addition to their normal job, which is nothing to do with accounting. Um, it's very, very difficult, and it becomes a, a people management issue in trying to manage people who don't report to you and so on. Um, the, the overall, certainly the guidance, therefore, is that make sure that you do some auditing of those numbers, because the auditors will come back to you as the Ipsos team, um, and make sure that you deal with the people you know gently and carefully, make sure that they know what they're doing. If you have grave issues about it, then you may want to think about hiring a consultant, because this is going to be a big, big area and you need someone who's good with something like Access or good with something like um, Excel, Excel, in addition to the fact that, that they actually know what they're doing with the account. Uh, so that was the third point. I think there was a couple of the previous one. None. The final one here, presentation lease is not being disposed or classified in, in, a, in accordance with Ipsos. This kind, of, this kind of follows on from the previous point. Just taking the last point there, finance lease is accounted for as an operating lease. You should have you should design decision trees and the decision tree says okay we have a lease is it a lease is it is it um I forgot what they're called now is it a concession agreement that's the word I'm looking for and then assuming that it's a lease is it operating is it finance and you should agree those decision trees with the auditors and that that's your focus you're then sending them out to, to people in the field and then they are using those decision trees assuming that those people are, more, are reasonably intelligent then they should be getting it right. Um, you need to make sure that there is consistency, um, and I have to say this, you need to make sure that everybody is using your decision trees and that they don't go in and design their own. Um, people who, who are, have done some accountancy training are very prone to do things like that. Once you've got that, then you can just do a random sample yourself to make sure that everything's going through correctly. Um, where you're more likely to get issues is with the first ones here, when it says leases failed to include certain information required. Right, again, designing a template will do that. But where we get things here is where we get um, leases which are not included in the balance sheet. Once again, you get the situation where the Ministry of Transport gives the Ministry of Defence a building, and they gave it to them in the 1940s, and it's now 60, 70, 80 years they've been using the damn thing. It's never been written down everywhere, but every year the Department of, whoever it was, I said, Department of Defence pays for the Christmas party or something. Uh, and this is a great opportunity where you can use it as as, um, as a cleanup item. Well, we actually had this, one of our offices in one organization I worked in, they had a warehouse that they used to keep old files in, and then and they rented it from another organization. In return, they actually paid them, I think, $2,000 a month, which is nothing, but they also gave them however many bottles of wine and food for their Christmas party. Um, this is where you use, this is where Ipsos is a real tool in terms of your cleanup. You need to get the legal department now writing formal agreements in the proper format that gives you the information that you need and formalizing these agreements. And, and people won't want to do this. Why do we need to do it? We never did it before. Why are we doing it now? Well, you need to do it now because now if we've got things like this where the proper rent of this building is 100,000 bucks a year, but we're getting away with 2,000 bucks for a very good Christmas party, you know, that needs to be shown as a donation um, and it needs to be shown as income in your ministry and, and this is the whole point of this, of tightening all of these things up. And you'll get a little bit of resistance. Your legal department won't necessarily want to draw these things up. And then you'll say, oh, well, if it's really 100000 bucks, we should be getting the money for it and so on. But these aren't your issues. Because if you don't address these issues, the auditors will. And then it's you that kind of looks dumb and lazy. So, so get these things fixed up. So, and you will get resistance. And again, you know, if you're dealing with people who aren't trained accountants, 
they won't have in their mind this idea, oh yeah, we, we, we let those people use that for nothing, so that's a lease, because there'll be no document for it. There's no money coming through the account, so, so why would they think of it? Okay, there were. We've done part three of leases. I have to say that, you know, the disclosure items as a teacher are fairly, are fairly dull and dry, and there's not a lot of laughs in there. It will become much more entertaining for you when you start to do it, because when you start to do it, you, you, then you'll have to get all the different all the problems of classification and the most important thing is setting up a system and then consistency with the system and as long as the auditors think that the system sounds sensible and logical you'll be fine again with these leases you're then going to have to work out well what are the minimum lease payments is there a legal document how much are they actually worth and some of these things will be going back years um it's a very very good tightening up of procedures exercise okay my name is Mark Fielding Pritchard. You know the deal. Like us on Facebook. Send us any comments. If you have comments or questions, please send them to us. We are here to help. Thank you for your time.